Mini episode 1195 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1195. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here, and we've got our FDH Motorsports Editor on the line, Mike Petak, today. Always a pleasure to have him in. We are talking NASCAR for 2020, and doing so, as per usual, through the prism of recapping our 2020 NASCAR Fantasy Draft that we did for FantasyDraftHelp.com. And uh, so Mike and I were participants in this along with uh, FDH Lounge dignitaries Raymond Smalley, Matt Patrone, and Anthony Patrone. And uh, this took place this past week. And we'll be uh, recapping it here today and getting Mike's thoughts on the drivers. Mike, thank you as always for being here today, my friend. Uh, pleasure to uh, get to break this down with you, and uh, in the uh, the way that it shook out, our 2019 winner, Raymond Swally, ended up uh, drawing the long straw here and uh, had the number one pick overall. You, Mike, picking second. I was third. Matt Patrone, fourth. Anthony Patrone, fifth. So we start off the first round, and uh, it's going pretty chalky there at the top, basically. Uh, Truex goes with the first pick. He is, of course, the first pick on the FDH uh, draft board. Uh, by the way, quick note about that side note at, uh, in, in our uh, fantasy racing guide that we have up, and you can find this, of course, on the main page at fantasydrafthelp.com as well as on our uh, NASCAR page for fantasydrafthelp.com. And the guide is Fantasy Racing Draftology 2020. We'll be talking more about that later on. But uh, a little bit of a difference on the draft board this year. We have listed, in addition to the last three years of where the drivers placed in the standings, the experts draft board, uh, so a compilation of some other industry uh, experts out there on what their draft boards were averaged out to. Again, past three years finish in NASCAR, wins, top tens, and polls for last year. All of that combined, in our estimation, left Martin Truex number one overall. And Raymond Smalley concurred, taking him with taking Martin Truex with that first pick. Uh, you, Mike, going for Joey Logano with the second pick. I was able with the third pick to get Kyle Busch. Uh, anytime you can get a guy with his uh, championship pedigree twice and uh, defending, that is especially good. Matt Harvick, or I'm sorry, Matt Patron takes uh, Kevin Harvick with the fourth pick, and Anthony Patron going with Jenny Hamlin for the fifth pick. So the, the first round shook out in the exact order of the FantasyDraftHelp.com draft board, and I say this as somebody who had a look at the draft boards uh, of the various players here. It just kind of shook out that way, Mike, as far as how we collectively ended up reflecting what the FDH draft board had for the first round. Yeah, I'm really not surprised. As usual, we nailed it, and uh, I, I'm sure the Trump brothers had no problem with the way the first round shook out. Well, at least one of them anyways, because, look, they both had Harvick first on their board. And this is one with Anthony. I mean, this is, you talk about a tradition like no other with FantasyDraftHelp.com and the FDH Lounge. For Anthony Patron, year in and year out, regardless of circumstances, Kevin Harvick number one on his board. I mean, I don't know what it would take for him to not have Kevin Harvick number one. Hey, Anthony, uh, Kevin Harvick's going to be driving with a boot on his car. I have Harvick first. Uh, hey, Anthony, he's got to drive a 75 town car this year instead of his regular car. I have Harvick first. Uh, hey, Anthony, the old guys from the Bartles and James commercial are going to be Kevin Harvick's pit crew. I have Harvick first. I, I don't think there's any limit to what it would take uh, to, to have him not be first on his board, Mike. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a top five guy no matter what. He is. Uh, I can't write on him too hard. Everybody knows that uh, Kevin Harvey is Anthony's favorite driver. So it's always been fun, Anthony. 
Yes, yes. Uh, the second round here, because we have a drop-off starting on the draft board. That's how we saw it anyways, that it started after the fifth pick. Uh, so in the second round, the next guy that we had on the draft board was Chase Elliott, and Anthony agreed. He took him with the first pick. Matt Patrone, very interesting. I know we're going to be talking about this one here. He went away from the FDH draft board by several picks and away from some of the other boards by looking at them. Jimmy Johnson, he is looking for a huge farewell season uh, by taking him with the second pick in the second round, which, uh, again, given the fall off that he's had the last couple of years, a fall off that uh, precedes this year's retirement, uh, it's a big gamble on Matt's part. Uh, but again, nobody that's driving today has the championship pedigree that he does. Uh, one of the best of all time, if not the best. So we'll see what he can do in his last year. With the third pick of the second round, uh, I, Rick Morris, able to get a little bit more championship pedigree, albeit not very recently. Brad Keselowski comes back to me. You, Mike, going for uh, the young Kyle Larson with the uh, fourth pick overall in the round. And for Raymond Smalley, he stays young again with his pick of Ryan Blaney, of course, a second-generation driver there. So a very interesting round, bookended by youth on either end. Uh, in the middle, Keselowski and Johnson with the championship experience. Your thoughts on round two? Round two, yeah, like you said, Jimmy Johnson was uh, more than a bit of a surprise, but again, he's got the championship pedigree. It's a farewell to work, you know. Uh, I don't know if he was looking past all that. You know, it's been a rough year for uh, past company Johnson, so, you know, like you said, nobody's got the championship pedigree that Jimmy Johnson does. No question about that. Uh, you've got a couple other guys here along the way who uh, still might have it in them to make a similar type run, but uh, the parity at the top uh, in, in the last 20 to 25 years, it really makes it extraordinary that he's been able to stand out the way that we that he has. Well, we go into round three, and uh, first pick there, William Byron goes to uh, Raymond with the second pick of the third round. Uh, Clint Boyer goes to you, Mike. I, with the third pick, uh, what do you know, I end up with both Bush brothers. I've got Kurt Bush after that pick. And uh, Matt Patrone uh, with the fourth pick in the third round. Uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, it's a little bit safer, maybe, value-wise, than the previous one. He goes for Eric Almirola. And the fifth pick uh, of the round, uh, you come back to Anthony Patrone, and he goes for Alex Bowman. So you get... This is, this is an interesting transitional round, I think, because in the first two rounds, you're expecting it to be your foundational guys, guys who are going to make the chase, who are going to be very high up in here. And this is the round where we're hoping that we get another qualifier in there. I think you have every right to hope and expect that with your third round pick, they're at least going to make the chase, because we're 15 deep here and 16 guys make the chase. So particularly earlier to middle of the round, you really should be nailing somebody that's going to make it. But uh, it's an interesting point because later on, uh, I think a lot of times people are picking for upside. This is sort of the balance, I think, of, of the earlier rounds where you're thinking it's going to be somebody that's really going to be in there. The later rounds, you're kind of gambling for upside. And the third round always seems to be kind of a hinge in these type deals where you're kind of looking for a little of both. Yeah, you're kind of you're hoping you can find somebody that makes a chase and looks at the race and gives you some points. And, I mean, it doesn't always happen that way. Like you said, the two of them where you start to teeter totter. You really, you know, you're getting to the point where, yeah, they should make the chase based on all the information that we have all put together and all the sports and whatnot. But, you know, this is what really make or break your team right here is from uh, round three going forward. Absolutely. And then as you get into the fourth round, we start to get a little bit younger still because, uh, again, the way that things are going right now, You've got uh, the younger drivers that are a lot of times now on the guaranteed contracts with the, uh, the, the smaller teams here as, as some of the journeymen are starting to get phased out even more than they have the last couple of years. Anthony, at the top of the fourth round, goes for a driver with a new crew chief this year uh, as, as he uh, takes Austin Dillon with his pick. Uh, from there, really sort of the exception to the youth of the fourth round You've got Matt going for a guy who at this point would have to be called old reliable in Ryan Newman, and uh, somebody who, again, has made the chase, albeit barely, in two of the last three years. Uh, Eric Jones, the third pick of the round, goes to me. 
uh, somebody who has made it uh, the last two years at 16th and 15th place, respectively. Uh, and then from there, very promising rookie Christopher Bell going to you, Mike. And then uh, with the fifth pick of the round, Tyler Reddick going to Raymond. We, we've got a very, very interesting uh, rookie class coming in here. And uh, again, Christopher Bell, emblematic of that, somebody who had uh, a lot of uh, great experience at the Xfinity level. So with him, with Reddick, you've, you've got some guys that are going to be trying to stick their heads up in the next couple of years as far as being the next sort of class of NASCAR drivers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was hoping Jones would come to me, but uh, he's being forward and you uh, put all, did a lot of hard work on this. Uh, once I saw, you know, who were behind me and Jones was still on the board and we were going to be given that he was going to be gone. <laughs> so I had, Thank to you. With, I had to go with my usual swap side. You do that in all sports. There's no question about it. Yeah, and Bell gives you that. He certainly, certainly does. And uh, I think that's something you stuck to in the last round as well. So you go through. And for Raymond, uh, the first pick overall in the fifth round, Daniel Suarez, and somebody who, uh, again, just on the cusp of the chase last year at 17th, 21st, and 20th uh, before that. So if you look at all of that, and he gets him here at the top of the fifth round, fairly decent value for you, uh, Mike, as I referenced a second ago here, Chris Buescher who, again, similar type numbers the last couple of years, 20th last year, 24th in 18, 25th in 17, and uh, a young guy who could be ready to make a jump up the ladder, I certainly think. Uh, I hope that goes for my guy as well here, Matt DiBenedetto, who has gone from 32nd to 29th to 22nd the last couple of years. A similar type jump from last year would put him in the chase. That would be awesome for me in the fifth round. Ty Dillon is the pick that goes to... Uh, Matt Patron, uh, that's a guy who's been kind of uh, on the hamster wheel the last couple of years, 24th, 27th, and 24th overall. Uh, he was 25th, tied for 25th on the experts draft board and 26th, I'm sorry, uh, 24th on our draft board. So we've got him uh, in, in the same area, uh, whether it be all kinds of different factors here. Everyone in the universe seems to have him pegged for 24th to 27th. Uh, Cole Custer, the last pick overall, another promising rookie going to Anthony uh, with the 23rd pick. This is something I don't remember him doing as much in the past, but I think it's to his credit, because I think Cole Custer has a lot of upside. I, I would expect, I think sometimes Anthony has even gone for a part-timer in this spot if it's somebody that he trusts, but this is a real smart move for him here, I think, as opposed to going for a part-timer with a name. Uh, Custer is definitely a very good value for him with the last pick. So again, a very young last round, as you would sort of expect with NASCAR. A lot of these guys looking to make a jump up into the chase. I think the odds are outstanding that one of these five is going to end up in the chase, maybe even two. Yeah, absolutely. Where this is where if you can be season long uh, fantasy programs, if you can get on a fourth and fifth rounder, they make the chase. That's a lot of points to really just be pushing towards the top. It is, because Denny Hamlin last year proved it. I mean, he was a guy who was not a high pick last year based on what he'd done previously, and, uh, yeah, he provided the excellent value. We're all looking for that this year. Absolutely. And, you know, you know, a lot of people go for the specialists in the late round, and, and like you said, the part-timers, the old reliables, and, you know, for the most part, you know, a lot of people went young, and they're, they're really hoping for the upside instead of getting points out of one race, points out of several races. That's right. That's that's what basically will make or break a season is your ability to get points in a lot of different places. You look at the teams overall. Uh, for Raymond, picking in pole position, Truex, Blaney, Byron, Reddick, and Suarez. For you, Mike, it's Logano, Kyle Larson, Boyer, Bell, and Busher. For me, Rick Morris, it's both Bush brothers with Keselowski picked in between, Eric Jones and D. Benedetto. For Matt Patron, it's Harvick, Johnson, Almirola, Newman, and Ty Dillon, uh, the, the team with pretty much the most uh, name value, or just about, may, maybe tied with me in that regard. I don't know what that's going to get either one of us, if anything. For Anthony, it's Hamlin, Elliott, Bowman, Austin Dillon, and Custer. Again, a little younger than Anthony usually goes, but picking in the fifth spot, uh, I thought making the right moves 
most of the time there as far as going with his guys as opposed to, again, part-timers or specialists or anything like that. So any yeah. of these teams really uh, jumping off the page at you, whether it's you feeling good about yourself or anybody else? You would think so, yeah. And, uh, again, that's the advantage sometimes of picking in those spots. And sometimes you can just kind of tell this going in because I could tell this is like the fourth or fifth year of doing the uh, fantasy tennis draft here for fantasygrafthelp.com. And I called it. I looked at it. I was like, wow, this is going to be more jammed up. Usually it's not jammed up. And after the Australian Open, uh, we are all in a tight-knit bunch there uh, with, with the way that our male and female players went. So sometimes you can just tell going into a season when teams look pretty evenly matched. And uh, at first blush, heading into Daytona, I would agree with you, Mike. That's the way it looks to me. Yeah, it's really a, it's really a tight race. Uh, you know, with Josh being taken so high, that's why I, you know, I could see him make third round. Because I think he probably would have got him third. And I just think that was too early. He could have got a higher quality driver. You know, sometimes if you're going to reach that early, I would kind of agree, and that's a thing where when you look at it, yeah, when there is something that, and again, and not to rip on the pick, but just I mean, in terms of the definition of the word reach, it kind of is. When you look at all of our draft boards, including the FDH draft board versus where Matt had him, he had the value calculated way differently. Now, again, he may very well have been correct if he wanted him in thinking he won't be there late third round. And that's one where it's a 50-50 gamble at best. Uh, that he would have been there at that point. But, yeah, when you're looking at other drivers still on the board, uh, the drivers uh, ahead of him on the FDH board, you know, somebody like Ryan Blaney, who we had uh, ninth on the board, he was ninth on the experts draft board, seventh, tenth, and ninth, respectively, the last three years. He had a win last year, 18 top tens, and a pole. I, I would say that uh, Blaney probably fits the profile exactly of the kind of guy you're talking about with the young upside versus what you think Jimmy Johnson might have in the tank for this year. Right. But if, if he gets on Jimmy Johnson, it doesn't matter where he drafted him. You know, if Jimmy Johnson turns into the Jimmy Johnson of old. Yeah. You know, Sean, Sean Matt up for, you know, being, you know, the smart guy in the room that had it figured out. And, you know, moves him right to the top of the class. Well, yeah, and that's a thing where, but, and again, not to raise a sore spot, which I know it will be with me and you being lifelong Cleveland Browns fans, but anytime you're counting on the position of I'm right and everybody else is wrong, we've seen how that works out. That's why value is so important on this. So, yes, Matt may be right on this, and yes, I think it's it's probably better than 50-50 Jimmy Johnson wouldn't have dropped to him in the third round. So it was now or never if he was going to take him. I do see that side of the coin. But as far as value and it basically kind of detaching a little bit from, you know, what you think somebody's going to do this year versus looking at the hard numbers and the probabilities and stuff, that's a perfect example right there. It's always possible that you're right and the rest of the world is wrong, but how often does that happen? Yeah. So, yeah, listen, uh, a real clip and save moment here, and I have very little doubt that if Matt is right about this, we will never hear the end of it. So, And you know what? And justifiably so. Justifiably so. After everything that we're saying, he's going to be entitled to his I told you so's if it comes to that. But uh, again, not real Jimmy Johnson type numbers last year. No wins, 12 top 10s, and one pole position. Uh, tied for 15th on the experts draft board. We actually had him 12th. He is actually undervalued on our draft board. So we have him ahead of most folks. And we didn't have him nearly as high as where Matt had him. So that kind of puts it into a little bit of perspective numerically. 18th last year in the standings. Almost unthinkable that he would not make a chase. But that's been the trajectory. He's dropped four spots each of the last two years. He'd been 14th in 2018. He'd been 10th in 2017. So that was the trajectory. Again, you didn't think it would keep going that way. He's going to drop another four spots. But he did. At the end of the day, you're looking at a guy that finished 18th last year. And yes, everything is going to be juiced up for the big finale tour. But when you're looking at it here, that's why we all came to the conclusion that we did, which was different than Matt's conclusion about Jimmy Johnson. Right. right. So, 
Like every year, we always say, we'll wait and see. You know, he's got Hendrick behind him. You know, Hendrick Motorsports, you know, in a hole, really had, had a, a, a Hendrick like year. So, you know, maybe look for the whole Hendrick team. Now, I've been really changed out uh, to have a, a bounce back here. I would agree with that. I think the odds are uh, very good. Uh, you can never you know, go go bankrupt betting on Hendrick to do well in NASCAR. So we will see how 2020 plays out. Daytona is just about upon us. And uh, again, the where you can find uh, this mock draft and uh, as well as uh, everything else in our draft guide, Fantasy Racing Draftology 2020 up on the main page of FantasyDraftHealth.com and also the NASCAR page on there. And uh, I know how much this always tickles you, Mike, that in the last couple of years, expanding beyond just covering NASCAR. So, invariably, we have the IndyCar and Formula One draft boards and suggested league guidelines, as well as for NHRA, breaking it down in the four divisions, as well as a top 20 across divisions. But here's the one, and I know this always gets you, the ultimate racing game. Draft board oh, and <laughs> and the dra- the guidelines across all the circuits. Uh, how much do you really know about racing and do your friends know? You can answer the question on who's the smartest of them all. You are drafting drivers from NASCAR, IndyCar, Formula One, and all four NHRA circuits. Uh, you're, you're taking a handful of drivers from each circuit. It's sort of like an all-star game kind of a deal across the circuits. And uh, based on the top ten finishes at the end of the year. So when you look at this, uh, like that is a thing where, uh, again, uh, one could very well go uh, absolutely bonkers uh, having one's head explode eraser style here, uh, trying to, to reach that kind of level of racing acumen. But certainly I think you would agree with me. Somebody that could win a league like that is the best of the best. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, yeah, it, it, it does make my head want to explode. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> and it could only come from the product of an insane mind like my own, which I readily cop yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. Who you're, else? You're being some kind of you call yourself insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could think of other uh, words as well. Uh, some would be synonyms, I suppose, like demented, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, that was that was a brainchild I'm particularly proud of. And, of course, that can be found uh, in the draft guide, Fantasy Racing Draftology 2020. And, of course, it will be uh, some notes from our uh, mock draft analysis today from you, from our FDH Motorsports editor, uh, the man that we lean on for all of this, Mike Petak. Thank you so much for being here today, my good friend. Oh, it's a pleasure. By the way, Ricky, I got to tell you this before we go. You know, in the uh, fantasy bowling league, the week that you, you uh, went to perfection on it, I, I had you on my team, but I had you bench that week. But I still want to congratulate you publicly on your 300 game. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hasn't been a 300 in a while, but there have been a few 700s. So, uh, yeah, that the, there might have been a little misinformation on the reporting. Uh, a 287. Uh-huh. 287 a couple weeks ago. I came close. I had the I had the first 10, but uh, yeah, it uh, it did not uh, end up uh, going my way in the end. But uh, yes, yes, yes. The the thumbs optional team still crushing it. Friday nights at Yorktown Lanes in the Parma Heights, Ohio. So yes, thank you for taking note of that. And yes, that that's what that's what you get for benching the anchor of thumbs optional. Uh, never bench me in your fantasy bowling lineup, Mike P. Tack, and let that be a lesson to all of you out there as well. I, I learned the hard way. Yes, yes. I just hope it doesn't cost you in your championship at the end of the season here. Uh, you never bench your fan- franchise players, and uh, yes, let that uh, be a lesson. So, uh, again, on that fine note, we yet again thank Mike P. Tack here today, and we thank you for tuning in to FDH Lounge mini-episode 1195.